so let's come before the Lord in a word of prayer as we get into our study today. Father, thank you so much for your great love for us. Thank you that you've adopted us into your family and that you've called us your children, Lord. And just as we sang in that song earlier that, that J.D. led us in, Lord, that life is short and we want to live it well. We want to live in a way that honors you. And so, Lord, as we dig into your word this morning, would you speak to our hearts? Would you draw us to yourself by your Holy Spirit? Would you convict us where we need conviction? Would you comfort us where we need comfort this morning, Lord? Would you encourage us? Would you call us up? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. And uh, last week in Philippians 2, we finished off in verse 16. And Paul encouraged us to do all things without complaining or disputing. And really was this reminder that we should not be whiners, right? Nobody likes somebody who's always whining and complaining all the time. And in fact, we should actually be doing the opposite. So rather than being those who are complaining, we should be giving thanks. That we need to cultivate an attitude of gratitude in our lives. Because in order to take joy, which remember the, the, the overall theme of this book is the theme of joy of the book of Philippians, this theme of joy. In order to take joy, we have to first learn to give thanks. And so today we continue on in Philippians, picking up in verse 17, and um, Paul kind of gives us an insight into some of the, the, the attitude that he has that causes him to be able to take joy. Some of the things that, that he has his focus on and his heart on that enable him to stay in that place of joyful gratitude before the Lord. And really, it, we're looking at Paul's attitude as he faced uncertainty about his future. If you remember, Paul was in prison, chained to a Roman guard. He's awaiting trial before Caesar. And for all that he knows, he's expecting to go to, before Caesar and be put to death. Now, we know that that isn't what actually happened this time. There was a later time in Paul's life that he did go before Caesar and was put to death. He was beheaded. But this time he actually, it results in his freedom. But as he's facing this, as he's facing this potential death, we see Paul's attitude about how he poured himself out in service and in ministry. And so I want to start with a question today. And this is a question for you to ask yourself. What is it that you hope to achieve in life? What are you hoping for in your life? What are your goals? What are your dreams? What is it that you are working towards right now in your life? Maybe I'll put it this way because maybe this would be a little bit easier to think about it in this sense. What, if you were to look back on your life, at the end of your life, what would have to happen in your life between now and then for you to define it as a success? If you were looking back on your life, how would you define your life as a success? Is it a certain job or position? A certain financial status? A good healthy relationship or a good family dynamic? The American dream? What is it that would define success for your life? For many of us, uh, success, we see it as looking for that thing that would satisfy our deepest desires. And see, here's the thing. We look and we look and we look and we look and we come up empty. Many people look to a job or a career to bring satisfaction in their lives and find that it doesn't bring it. Many people look to marriage or a relationship to satisfy. Many people look to sex to satisfy or to drugs or alcohol. Many people look to religion to satisfy. Maybe you look to the next newest gadget or toy, like you see the iPhone X came out and you're like drooling over it, right? but it's $1,000 for a phone. I remember when a phone came free with your phone plan, right? $1,000 for a phone, that's crazy. Or maybe you look to adventure, the next thrill, or travel, or power, or influence, or maybe you look to politics. What defines success to you? You know, there's, when we look at those things, some of those things can bring a certain level of satisfaction in our life. We understand that. But ultimately, they all leave us empty at the end of the day. So we go on looking, and we go on looking, and we go on looking. And when we finally reach what we have defined as success, we keep looking more because we find that that doesn't satisfy. It's kind of like, um, it was about a year ago, 
uh, I remember I was working at Calvary Belmar and we had an office and I wanted a picture of the Denver skyline for my office, right? So I wanted like a large picture of the Denver skyline. And so I looked online, I looked around, I tried to find one, I couldn't find one anywhere, right? And so I'm like, okay, well, I'd kind of just given up on it at this point. It'd been a couple months of just occasionally looking for something. And one day my family and I, we were in Ikea and Ikea is just a whole day thing. I mean, like, especially if you live up here, but just it is by itself because it takes about an hour to walk through one floor. But after you walk through the first floor, you have to walk through the second floor to get to the cash registers, right? It's, it's just this crazy big thing. So we're walking through there. The kids are, you know, spinning the shopping carts around because they have four spinny wheels, which I'll never understand. And so we're pushing through. We got a few things. And then as we're getting close to the exit, I looked up and I saw like rays of light shining behind it. This Denver city skyline that was about three feet tall by five feet wide. And I was like, that is what I've been looking for right there. I wanted it to hang on my wall over my desk. And I saw it, it was like 50 bucks. And I was like, sold, that is so cheap. It was a canvas thing. I was like, that's awesome. So I, we picked it up, I stuck it in my cart and we're trying to get out the door with three kids and just craziness and somehow we went through the checkout line and somehow we, just because three kids is craziness. We got down to the car and I got home and I realized that we had left the picture at Ikea. And I'd, been, I'd looked for this thing for months, right? And so I was like, this is what I want. I saw it. I was so excited about it. We bought it. We stuck it in the cart. Somehow it didn't make it home with us. And so I'm sitting there. I'm like, oh, Okay, well, I'm going to call them and see if, if, if they noticed that it was sitting there. So I found out very quickly that you cannot call an individual IKEA store. You have to call the 800 number that goes to their national hotline. And there's one national hotline. So I waited on hold forever. And so I'm sitting there and I'm talking to the person finally. And, and I'm like, so I, I bought this big picture and I think I left it at the store. Can, you, can we get a hold of the store to check? And they're like, no, I can't get a hold of the store. Aren't you IKEA? yes, but I can't get a hold of the store. Like, how do you communicate then? I mean, like, how do they order stuff? And how do you, like, how does this work? You can't get a hold of, they're like, well, I can't call the store, but here's what I can do. I can look on their, like, return registry and see if it got stuck in there somehow. And so, like, they, they pulled it up on the computer, and they're like, okay, well, I see that there was one picture that was found at Ikea. I can see it on this thing right here on the computer, but I can't tell you what picture it is. And so I'm like, you can't, Really? can't we just call them? I mean, seriously, there's got to be a phone number there. There's a, I know there's a phone there at Ikea somewhere, right? <laughs> no, I can't call them. This is the best I can do is tell you that there is a picture that's there. It may or may not be your picture. So I'm like, okay, well, all right. So I climbed in my car. I drove down to Ikea, which was pretty far away from our house. And so I pulled up, I walked in and I went to the return thing and I waited in line for like 15 minutes because the return line is ridiculous. I got up to the desk and I'm like, I left my picture here and I'm looking for, you know, to pick it up. And they said, well, oh, we restocked it. <laughs> it's like, you restocked something that I purchased. Isn't that theft, right? No, <laughs> I didn't say that, but that's what I'm thinking. Like, <laughs> so they restocked and they're like, here, well, here, I can't give you that picture, but I'll give you a credit so you can go through and get another one. And so then I go through Ikea again, you know, the whole process, pick out another picture. I go and I pay for it. I get in the car. I'm like, oh, okay. I got it. As I'm pulling out of the parking lot, I go down to the street and I look left and then I look right and I step on the gas and smack, I totally T-boned a BMW. And I'm sitting there thinking at that moment, that picture was not worth this. <laughs> Can I return it? <laughs> like, but see, I, I think that this is, this, is like, this is an illustration of the way that we live our lives because we start, we're working for this thing that we don't even really know what it is and we strive and we strive and it's like, if I can just get this, if I can just get this, if I can just get this, and then like you get it and it's just like, no, it wasn't actually anything. It's just, uh. And we strive and we strive and we strive to reach this goal of success and when we reach what we've defined as success, we find that it's empty. And so what is real success? What is the meaning? What's the purpose? What's the point? Well, we get a hint in the attitude of Paul here in these next couple of verses. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 17 through 18, he says this. Yes, 
And if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. And so Paul's saying, hey, if I'm being poured out like a drink offering for you guys, for the gospel, I'm glad. I rejoice. I celebrate that. Now, if you don't know what a drink offering is, a drink offering was an offering that they would make in conjunction with the sacrifice, the animal sacrifice that they would make in the Old Testament. And so the drink offering would either be poured on top of it or next to it. It was usually wine or something like that, wine or, or you know, a, a special drink that they would pour out as they're offering this sacrifice. And so Paul's saying, hey, if I'm poured out completely, and really what he's getting at is if I die, if I go to Caesar and I face death, if I'm poured out all the way for your faith, for the gospel, I'm glad. I rejoice in that. Maybe another, a more contemporary translation might say something like this. If I die as a result of pouring out my life for you and for the gospel, I rejoice in that. I'm glad. Won't you rejoice with me? That's what Paul's saying. He's saying, you know what? My life is poured out one way or another. Whether I stay here and I live for the gospel or whether I die for you and for the gospel, either way, I'm poured out and I rejoice in that. I'm glad about that. Now, we've talked about joy being happiness that's unaffected by circumstance. We've talked about kind of joy and stuff. This, but this idea of gladness is a different term. It, it's more of like a feeling. Like we talk about joy not being a feeling, but something you own, something that you take, something that you make yours. But gladness is definitely a feeling. Paul's saying, hey, if I'm poured out to death, I am glad. Won't you be with me? How can he say that? I mean, how can Paul say, you know what, if, if this just ends and I'm done as I go to Caesar, I'm glad about that. How can he actually say that? It's because Paul could look at his life and say this. Whatever happens, I rejoice because I know that I have spent my life wisely. I've invested my life wisely. He could look at his life and say that he was glad about how he had spent it. So whether he stayed and kept working for the ministry or whether he went home to be with the Lord, he was glad about it because he had poured himself out and he knew it and he rejoiced in that. See, Paul invested his life for an eternal impact. Now, I want you to think just for a second about your life. What if everything that you have was gone? Not just your stuff. I mean, yeah, your car, your house, your clothing, not having food. What if, I mean, that, yeah, if all that stuff's gone, but not just that, your friends turned their back on you. Your family walked away from you. What if everything that you had was gone? What is left if everything was gone? Because whatever is left is the only thing that lasts. That's the only thing that's real. Everything else is just temporary. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. See, he's saying have an eternal perspective, an eternal mindset, because nothing here is going to satisfy you, first off, and nothing here is going to leave a lasting impact. You know, uh, Jim Carrey, everybody knows Jim Carrey, right? Funny guy, you think Jim Carrey is like, man, that's a good me. If anybody achieved success, it was Jim Carrey, right? This is what Jim Carrey had to say. He said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see it's not the answer. That's Jim Carrey. You think if anybody like lived life to the fullest and achieved everything that they wanted and had a great life, it's Jim Carrey, right? He lived it and realized, man, it's not the answer. There was an author who had incredible success and fame and fortune, sold millions upon millions of books. And he was once asked what he wished somebody would have told him when he first started. You know, that's kind of a question that many people get that are successful. What would, what, if somebody had told you one thing when you started, what would you wish it had been? You know, a younger you. This is what he said. He said, I wish that someone would have told me that when you reach the top, there's nothing there. This guy had achieved all of his dreams, sold millions of books, the thing he wanted to do more than anything in life. 
And when he did it, he realized it was empty. See, so many people have never stopped to consider this. You look back years later and wonder why your relationships have fallen apart and why we feel empty even though we've achieved the things that we've set out to do. It's because those things in and of themselves are empty. Solomon knew this, King Solomon. He was the wisest man alive, also the wealthiest man alive at the time that he lived. The kingdom of Israel was the largest it had ever been before or after when Solomon was king. And this is what he had to say in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. He said, everything is meaningless, says the teacher. Completely meaningless. What do people get for all their hard work under the sun? This is Solomon. I mean, he was more wealthy than anybody before or after him in Israel. More power than anybody before or after him. He looked at it all and said, it's meaningless. See, life under the sun, as Solomon saw it, was meaningless. All the things that we strive to achieve in this world, all the success, all the power, all the toil, even all the fun and all the adventure, it's all meaningless. And I don't know about you, but I really don't want to waste my life. I don't want to waste my life. And so what on earth can we do to not waste our lives? I phrase that very specifically because I think that there is something on earth that we can do to not waste our lives. There is something. We're not destined to a life of meaninglessness. We're not destined to a life of purposelessness. We are not stuck working towards things that will fade. We can have an eternal impact with our lives. We can store up treasures that will never be taken from us. We can be part of building a kingdom that will never be overthrown. We can have a legacy that is eternal and impacts thousands, if not millions of people for eternity. We can live a life of meaning and purpose and passion and direction that accomplishes more than you could possibly imagine. You might be thinking, how do I do that? I mean, you just told me like everything that we do on this earth is meaningless. And then you're telling me, but there is a way to have, how do I do that? Like, I don't want to be, I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to do all the meaningless stuff. How do I find that? How do I find that purpose? It's nothing drastic. In fact, It's incredibly simple. It's where your focus is. You ever hear that saying, it's like, what's the main thing? I don't even know who said this. You know, somebody will know it, I'm sure. What's the main thing? Like, think about what's the main thing. Keep the main thing the main thing. Have you heard that before? That's the focus. What is the main thing for you, for your life? What is really important? Set your focus on that thing. What is of eternal impact? What is of eternal consequence? Keep the main thing the main thing. You know, there was a guy, um, I read this article not too long ago. There was a guy uh, who found a wasp nest in his garage, okay? And, you know, I've shared this before, but you'll, you'll learn this repeatedly. There are two types of creatures that I really think are like direct results of the fall. One is spiders, okay? They're just evil. There's nothing good about spiders. The other one is wasps, okay? Wasps, like, there's nothing beneficial about wasps. Like, you can't, every time I eat outside, I get surrounded by wasps. Well, this guy found a wasp nest in his garage. And so he's like, how am I going to get rid of these wasps out of my garage? So he's sitting there, he's thinking, he's looking at his wall of his garage, and then he notices, he remembers that he had some smoke bombs that were left over from like fireworks the prior year, right? Smoke bombs. And so he's like, I know, I'm going to smoke them out. So he lights a smoke bomb in his garage. The smoke bomb then lights off all the other fireworks that were in his garage. And the whole garage catches on fire and burns to the ground. Now he killed the wasps. (laughs) They were gone. (laughs) that's, That's a very effective way of killing wasps, right? But was killing the wasps the main thing? I mean, I don't really know. I mean, to the expense of killing, of destroying your whole garage, I mean, probably 100 grand to rebuild that thing, right? Was it worth it? But see, this is what we do. We're so focused on killing the wasps that we burn down the garage in the process. And see, Paul's saying, get your focus on what really is important. What's the main thing? Colossians chapter 3, verse 2 through 3 says this, Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. 
For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. See, when our mind is on things on the earth, we're looking at like, how can I get rid of the wasps? And then we end up burning down the garage in the process. See, we set our mind on things above, not on things in the earth. As we looked at earlier, 2 Corinthians 4, 18, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So we we want to set our eyes on the eternal stuff. Set your mind, set your heart, set your course on the things of the Lord, the kingdom of heaven. See, if your course isn't set on the kingdom of heaven, if your course isn't set on the things of the Lord, you're going to keep going back to the stuff of the world. This is what we do. You ever see like like a little kid try to eat a lemon? Have you ever watched that before? So when my son, this is like a year and a half ago, when my son was really little, Josiah, our youngest one, when he was really little, like we thought it'd be funny to sit around and give him a lemon. We were sitting at, at, at Smash Burger, and so we gave him a lemon to eat, and I took a video of it, and I just want to show you this. Okay, so let's watch this together. <laughs> So he did this for like half an hour, like not even kidding. He'd sit there and he'd suck on it and then he'd look at it again and then he'd put it in his mouth again. And he did it over and over and over and over again. And the other kids were egging him on, put it in your mouth, put it in your mouth, put it in your mouth, right? They thought it was so funny. And see, this is what we do though. This is like, we think that we're going to find satisfaction in whatever it is that we're looking at. And it's like, I'm going to try this. And then you try it, it's like, Ugh. maybe if I try it again, right? that's what we do. Right? Like they say the definition of insanity, which is not, this is not a clinical definition, but they say it's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? But this is what we do. It's like we pick the lemon up. It's like, well, maybe if I just numb my tongue a little bit, then it'll be all right. And the, everybody else is egging you on. Yeah, go after that. Go after that. Do that again. That's what the world would tell you to do. Yeah, go after the lemon. Try it again. Oh, it stings the first time, but it doesn't hurt much after that. And we keep trying, and we keep trying, and we keep trying And we end up burning the garage down because we're so focused on the things of the world rather than the things of the kingdom of heaven that we're missing the real meaning and purpose behind it all. Now, you've probably heard um, this saying. You know, there's a few sayings that are Christianese sayings that I I really think are so horrible. They're totally unbiblical. I shared one with you a couple weeks ago. You know, the one that says, you know, God will never give you more than you can handle. And I talked about how that's just a lie because the Bible tells you that God will give you more than you can handle. But that's not what we're talking about today. The other one, the one I want to point out today, is you've probably heard this before. When someone says, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. You ever heard that before? Don't be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good. Why would you say that to somebody? I have never in my entire life met someone that is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Our problem is the opposite of that. We are so earthly-minded, we're no heavenly good. That's the real problem. C.S. Lewis said this about it. He said, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next. The apostles themselves who set on foot the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark on the earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. And this is what he had to say to wrap it up. He said, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they've become so ineffective in this one. See, it's because our focus isn't on the things of the kingdom of heaven that we are ineffective here. Now, being heavenly minded doesn't mean just sitting around and daydreaming about what heaven's going to be like. I mean, yeah, that's fine, but that's not, that's not being heavenly minded. Being heavenly minded is focused on the things of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 gives us insight into this. Jesus says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom of God. 
Seek God first. And all the other stuff will get added. All the other stuff will get taken care of. God knows that you need to pay your bills. God knows that you need to take care of stuff in your life. He knows that you need to have a little fun every once in a while. He knows all that stuff, right? When our focus is on seeking God first, he takes care of the rest of that. But when we're seeking all the other stuff, when we're seeking getting our bills paid, when we're seeking getting this done, when we're seeking getting that done, we're trying to burn down the wasp nest and we end up burning down the garage. And God's saying, seek me and I'll take care of that stuff. Seek first my kingdom and all that stuff's gonna be added to you. And so my question for you today is this, just to ask yourself, don't worry, I'm not gonna like quiz you on it or something like that, but just to ask yourself, am I heavenly minded or am I earthly minded? Where is my focus? What is it that you're living for? What are you being poured out for? See, Paul knew what he was being poured out for. He looked at his life and he knew where he, he, he was pouring all of his energy, all of his time, all of his strength. He knew where he was pouring it. And he said, you know what? Even if I'm poured out completely, man, I'm glad. I rejoice in that. If you're to look at your life, what are you being poured out for? You know, I have met many people on their deathbed as a pastor. I've sat in hospital rooms and talked with them right before they go to be with the Lord. Most, for the most part, they're, they're sitting there and they're, like, they're excited about it, like ready to meet the Lord. But, but, but I'll guarantee you this. When they talk about their regrets in life, I have never once met someone on their deathbed who has said, I really wish I'd spent more time looking at Facebook. I really wish I had posted one more Instagram post. I say that jokingly, but nobody says, I really wish I had earned more money. No one says even, I really wish I had had more adventure or traveled more. Those aren't the things that they say. What are the things that they say? They say, I wish I had spent more time investing in people. Or they say, I wish I had spent more of my time and my energy on the things of the kingdom of heaven rather than building my own stuff up because everything that I built is gone now. I can't take it with me. See, it's in that moment, suddenly you're very heavenly minded because you're like, wow, everything that I've worked on, is gone. It's, it's, I'm leaving it right now, right here. So don't be so earthly minded that you're no heavenly good. Put down the lemons. Don't burn the garage down. Now, you might ask yourself, how do I really know? How do I, how do I judge whether I'm earthly-minded or heavenly-minded? Well, there's a good test in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21. Jesus gives us a self-quiz, right? A self-examination. We can look at our own lives and say, this is how I know. And so it says this in verse 19. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Now he's not talking just about money here. He is talking about money though, but it's not just about money. I mean, what he's talking about is what are the things that you treasure in life? Where is your heart? What is the thing that you're treasuring with your time, with your energy, with your finances, with your serving, with your heart? See, when you look where your treasure is, that's where your heart really is. Is your treasure the things that will have an eternal impact? If not, it's a good time to reevaluate. You say, Lord, where would you have me invest my energy? Where would you have me invest my time? Where would you have me invest my resources? Where would you have me invest my finances to generate an eternal return? Now, I'm not saying, don't get me wrong about this. I'm not saying that you should quit your job and go live in a tent or something like that. That's not what this is at all. Because God has put you where you are, very specifically, and actually on purpose. I believe that. We're going to talk about that a little bit next week. But what I am saying is this. God wants to use you right where you are, in the place that you are, but to, for an eternal impact, for an eternal kingdom. But you have to have your mind focused on the things of the Lord. Not just drifting through life, not just going after the wasp nests, not burning down the garages, not sticking the lemon in your mouth over and over and over and over and over again. 
really evaluating where you are and being heavenly minded about those things as you're in them. See, God has put you there on purpose, so you need to be purposeful in what you do. Now, see, there's a little bit of a potential trap in all this, and I just want to point this out before we move on, because, see, you might be in a spot in your life where you're like, man, I have totally wasted my life, and you just feel totally bad about yourself, and that's not the point of this at all. That's not it at all. You have not wasted your life. You're still breathing. You're here today, right now. You're still living it. I look at Moses, right? You think about Moses, one of the biggest figures in the Bible. Moses was kind of just like wasted his time until he turned 80 years old. He was 80 before God used him really for anything, right? 80 years old. Think about that. I mean, he just, like the first 40 years, he thought he was something special, and then he realized he wasn't because he killed a guy, and he's like, oh man, I better run. Then he spent 40 years in hiding, right? Just being a shepherd, like totally could have been second in command in the, in the whole kingdom of Egypt, could have taken the people of Israel, and he's just hiding out until he's 80 years old. And then finally God's like, hey, pay attention. I've got work for you to do. Moses was 80. It doesn't matter what your past has been. It doesn't matter where you're at today. What matters is that today, right where you are, right now, you can refocus your eyes, your heart on the things of the kingdom of God, and God can use you for dramatic impact right here, right now, today, in your job, in your family, in your school, right where you are, if your eyes are set on him. Don't waste your life. Put down the lemon. You've been placed here in Colorado, in the Vale Valley, in this church, on purpose for such a time as this. So set your eyes on the things of heaven. Be heavenly-minded. Lay up those treasures in heaven. Invest in the one investment that will give an eternal return. I want you just to imagine, just for a second, if you were able to do that with your life, if you're actually able to say, you know what, I'm not going to focus on this. I'm not going to get distracted by the lemons. I'm not going to get distracted by the wasps. I'm not going to think that success in this career path is what's going to make me happy. I'm not going to think that success in relationships over here is what's going to make me happy. I'm not going to think that any of this other stuff is going to make me happy. I'm going to realize that the only source of eternal life and joy is in Jesus Christ and in seeking the things of heaven. Imagine what your life might start to look like if you're able to take that perspective on a day-to-day basis? What might your life look like and what might other lives look like as a result of your life? And then multiply that right here, second service at Calvary Vale. What would the world look like if this group of people was able to do that? I mean, think about like who the, the, the disciples were, right? They were a bunch of mess-ups those guys, it's like Peter was hot-headed. James and John were called the Sons of Thunder. You ever wonder how they got that nickname? Sons of Thunder? That's not a compliment, by the way, right? <laughs> it's like a biker gang, right? It's like I'm thinking like that was the first biker gang right there, James and John. Jesus loves bikers too, I know it, right? <laughs> but like what? God took the foolish things. And he says, you know what? I'm going to take the most far out there. I'm going to take a tax collector. I'm going to take some fishermen. I'm going to take guys that nobody would think could do anything. And I'm going to use them to flip the world upside down on its head. If God can do that with those guys, imagine what he could do with you. Imagine what he could do through your life. Say, I don't know about you, but I don't want to waste my life. I want to live it well. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your great love for us, Lord, that you look upon us and you love us with an undying, never-failing love. And Lord, I thank you that you have not destined us to a life of no meaning and no purpose. I thank you that you have an impact for each person in this room to make in this community, in this world. Lord, we, forget, we, we ask your forgiveness for those times that we have focused on our own kingdoms. We ask your forgiveness for those times that we have focused on things that we think are gonna bring us satisfaction and we know that they really won't. We ask your forgiveness for those times that we've picked up the lemon and done it again and again and again. That we've gotten off course. Lord, we want to refocus our eyes on you today. 
We wanna be so heavenly minded, so focused on the kingdom of heaven that we can't help but be earthly good because our eyes are on you. Lord, may we with Paul look back at the end of our life and say, you know what? Even if I'm poured out, I rejoice because I know I invested it wisely. And Lord, I pray for anybody that's here today that's never put their trust in you. They've never asked your forgiveness for their sin. They've never received your gift of life. And maybe they're sitting there right now and they're thinking, you know what? My whole life has been built around nothing. I have no purpose. I'm looking at it and it's just, what? Why am I even doing this? Lord, if there's anybody here that's never received your gift of life, they've never been adopted into your family to find their true meaning and their true purpose, would you just speak to them right now by your Holy Spirit? The word says that no one comes unless they're drawn by the Father. So Lord, would you draw them right now? If you're here this morning, if you're listening online or you're listening on the radio and that's you and you'd like to put your trust, your faith in Jesus Christ, right where you're at, I just want you to stick your hand up in the air. And I'm gonna pray with you if that's you this morning. Awesome, I see that one. Cool. All right, if that's you, just between you and the Lord, I want you to take a second and express your trust in him. Say, Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I ask that you would forgive me. I wanna turn from my sin and follow you. Would you please make me yours? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand up as we sing this next song. And as we do, um, you can come up here and we're gonna take communion together today. So as we're singing this song, would you grab the cup and the bread and take it back with you to your seat and just hold on to it for a couple minutes. We're gonna take together and uh, let's worship together.
Lord, we thank you that you poured yourself out for us. You know, today we talk about Paul and his attitude towards the fact that he had poured his life out. But Lord, you poured yourself out for us out of your great love. You looked at us dead in our sin and you poured yourself out to give us life. And we celebrate that today, Lord. As we take communion together, we remember your sacrifice, that your body was broken for us to restore us. And so, Lord, as we think about those things in our life that we've been chasing after, the lemons that we've been chasing after, Lord, thinking that we're going to find fulfillment in those things, Lord, we want to bring those and lay them at your feet right now, knowing that only you can bring that life that we're looking for. Lord, your word says to taste and see that the Lord is good. We want that experience in our hearts, Lord. We want to taste of your goodness. We want to grab hold of your love. And so, Lord, we, we trade in our lemons for your goodness. And, Lord, as we take communion together today, Lord, we reflect on what you've done. We want to make that exchange with you this morning, Lord. We want to trade you all of our junk and receive your goodness. And so thank you for letting yourself be broken for us, that your body was broken, Lord. As the word says that by your stripes we are healed, thank you for that. And we take the bread together in Jesus' name. Amen. And Lord, as we talk about pouring out in a drink offering and pouring ourselves out for you, Lord, we remember that you literally poured out your blood for us. And Lord, as the word says that the, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness for sins, Lord. And so we thank you that you shed your blood for us. You, the perfect one, the almighty God, sacrificed yourself to give us life. And so Lord, thank you for pouring out for us. We remember that and we reflect on that as we take the cup together in Jesus' name. And Lord, we praise you for your goodness and your love. We don't want to waste our lives. We want to live them well for you, Lord. With our eyes set on heaven, our focus on the kingdom, knowing that you're going to take care of all the other stuff, Lord. You're going to provide for our needs. You're going to provide for our, even many of our wants. Our eyes just need to be on you. Help us have that heavenly focus, that eternal perspective. We want to live our lives well. In Jesus' name, amen.